2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you turn in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, um, next week's celebration, the only thing we need from you is to just come on out and bring a dessert, all right? Bring a dessert with you, uh, store-bought or preferably home-crafted, ladies and men. Uh, our church does great with desserts, and uh, that's always a, an awesome thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you've been through Judgment House, you know that this year we have dedicated the drama to the memory of Austin Roberts. And for a lot of you, this won't be news to you, but Austin uh, was a young lady who grew up in our church, was part of our youth department, just the, the best, sweetest girl. Loved to laugh and sing and play her guitar, just love life. And we got word last May that Austin had been driving down an old country road near Tyler and she had lost control of her vehicle. It had gone off the road to the right. She had overcorrected back left, went into a ditch, hit a tree, and her life was taken instantly. And Austin was 21 years old. James and Cindy, a couple of weeks ago, Austin's parents were so gracious. I, I was just amazed at the grace of God in them because they, they filmed an interview with us. It's on YouTube. We showed it a couple of weeks back just talking about what God has been doing in their life with, with the hardest of circumstances. And, and we asked permission to tell Austin's story at Judgment House. And the, and the beauty of this is I've been able to come down to the end of the presentation each night when, when James... And Brandon and I get to, to talk to folks after they've gone through the whole drama and ask them, listen, life is short and there's more to life than this life. Are you prepared for eternity? The beautiful thing is we we're able to tell Austin's story and then say, listen, on October 5th, 2011, Austin Roberts walked through Judgment House. Same judgment scene you went through. Same hell scene. Same heaven scene. She came right into this room and sat down and, and in the same chairs you're in. And Austin Roberts, this beautiful little church girl, realized being a beautiful little church girl doesn't get you to heaven. And she came through and she said, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Christ is my only hope. Jesus, I'm giving my heart to you. And the thing I've told them, the beautiful comment is, listen, on that country road, that 21-year-old little girl, her body was broken. But Austin Roberts wasn't broken. She's more alive today than she's ever been. We've been in a series on the end times, and last week we brought the first of two parts, a message on heaven. And last week we talked about heaven, the ultimate place. This morning I want to talk to you about heaven, the ultimate people. The ultimate people. Last week we, I read you a verse from 1 Corinthians 2. This is not our text, but it is powerful. Where Paul said, as it is written, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. What he's saying is there's an afterlife, and your five physical senses won't do you a bit of good in understanding it. He says the culture's not going to get it right. All their prognostication, prognostications about what's going to happen after you die, it's not going to get you there. But he says God has told us a whole lot about the afterlife through the Holy Spirit of God. He said he's going to tell you some things about the afterlife. And our question is, how will he do that? Well, let's look in our text this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 how many of you glad you're here today say amen. amen me too I'm glad you're here too second Corinthians 5 verse 1 for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle our body this tent that our soul is dwelling in right now were dissolved if it died we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay? When your body dies, that ain't the end of it. Verse 2. For in this body we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. We're longing for something more in this old body. 
If so that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, this tent, this body, do groan being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. We don't just want to be, we don't want it to be the end of us. We don't want to be disembodied souls. We long for life. We want to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. We want something more desperately. Now he that hath wrought or designed us for the self-same, the very same thing, is God who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Okay? We're talking about the Spirit again. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Notice that. For a Jesus follower, you're either in the body or you're with the Lord. You're either absent from the body and with the Lord or you're in the body. And and I want you to notice, remember the question we asked was, the Spirit said, the five senses aren't going to do you a whole lot of good in understanding the afterlife, but I can. I can tell you what it's like. Well, how's he going to tell us? A powerful verse, listen, this is a game changer, verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. The Spirit is going to show you by faith what is coming in the afterlife. And friends, so many of you know this verse. Where do you get faith? Romans 10, 17, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. The beginning of our trusting that God is who He said He is. The beginning of our trusting that life works the way God said it works. The beginning of defining ourselves not by what men think we are, but by by what God says we are, is this. Faith comes, it starts, it begins by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, for far too many of us, we have a real low opinion of heaven because we've listened to the culture and not the word. If you listen to the culture, you get this whole notion of harps and halos and St. Peter greeting you at the gate and angels earning their wings. And let me just tell you, that's all not biblical. It's cultural. If you're here and you're, you're not all that excited about eternity as a Jesus follower, let me just tell you, I believe you got a warped view of eternity. We need to go back to the beginning of our faith and find out what God has to say about it. Last week, the ultimate place. This week, this morning, the ultimate people. I want to tell you three things about our born-again loved ones that are true this morning. Okay, Those Jesus-following loved ones that are already home with him. I got my dad on the other side. Some of you got children on the other side. Brothers and sisters and friends that you did life with on the other side. Let me tell you a few things. If that book is true and more than mythology, let me tell you a few things about what's going on with them today. Things that we Jesus followers have to look forward to for all eternity. You may be here today and say, Brian, that's not really me. I I, I came to Calvary, somebody invited me, or I came through that judgment house and I, I didn't really get all that, but I wanted to come check it out this morning if you're not a Jesus follower and you're here praise God you're here we're so happy you're here right but we don't think you're here by accident we have to be real honest with you I think the fact that you're here means he's after you (laughs) and rather than being scared of that get excited about that right we're not here to rush you. We're not here to. What, that's one of the. That's, that's one of my only complaints on Judgment House. One of the things that, that bothers me sometimes, is is, is sometimes we want to be real careful about saying, you got to do it right this second or you can't do it. Okay. For some of you, you have questions. You have things. You, you can't. You can't push them to the background. You've got to get some answers. And let me just say, we're glad you're here. Come get some answers. All right. The ultimate place and the ultimate people. Three things about our born-again loved ones. First of all, they are very much alive. They are very much alive. The Bible makes it crystal clear that a person's soul lives on after death. You read it in our text. And by the way, when I talk about soul, 
realize I'm talking about the essential you, your mind, will, and emotions, your personality, that thing beyond just the physical that makes you, you, that's your soul, right? Um, my son Vance down here looking all sleepy. We, we, he hates it when I use him as an illustration, but here we go, bro. Here he goes. Um, last night they were telling me, you know, Vance is in the heaven scene, and they were like, he was in his white robe, and he was laying on the streets of gold between scenes, just face down. And, and one of them was like, look, he keeps working his toes on the streets of gold. He's going to wear, he's going to wear a hole in the streets of gold. Like, get up. But I, but the thing is like, beyond just him as a physical person, I was like, yeah, that's Vance. I, I knew that's his personality. I, I knew instantly that has Vance written all over it. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Your soul is you, right? And, and here's, here's the bottom line. Your soul lives on after your body's death. Listen to some verses, Ecclesiastes 12. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, the spirit will return to God who gave it. When Christ is hanging on the cross, you remember he had, he had these criminals on either side of him, and this one guy on one side of him, one just mocks him um, along with everybody else, but one says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Well, Jesus either got it wrong, or a lot of us may have misunderstood what he meant. Because here's the thing, that day, that guy was going to die. He died that day. Jesus knew he was going to die that day. But he said, you, not your body, but your soul, will be with me today in paradise. A few moments later, Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He gave up his soul. He gave up his spirit. His spirit left his body. Our text makes it crystal clear a person's soul lives on after death. But it also makes it crystal clear that a Christian soul immediately goes to be with Christ. Okay, let me just be honest with you. And not to not to, not to crush anybody's former teachings or beliefs or to be rude or to be boorish. I'm just telling you, if you're looking for purgatory in the Bible, you can't find it. That's an invention of, of the Roman Catholic Church. It's not there. If you're looking for soul sleep in the Bible, you have to take a lot of Old Testament passages and twist them around a bit. The idea that somehow you go to sleep when you die and you wake up at the resurrection. The bottom line is there's two states. You're in the body as a Christian or you're with Jesus. So what about our loved ones that have gone on before? Listen, if they're not in the body, they're with Jesus. Jesus said to Mary and Martha in John 11, um, they're so upset because their brother got sick and he died. And they're saying, Jesus, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked her, do you believe that? What's he saying? Lazarus still alive? He's not in this body, but he hasn't ceased to be. He hasn't ceased to live. He is very much alive, Mary and Martha. And I'm about to do something fantastic. I'm going to bring him back from the dead. Y'all are going to be real happy about that. I'm not sure how happy he's going to be when I yank him out of heaven and bring him back down to this old earth. But those that live and believe in me never die. That's what he said. Our born-again loved ones on the other side don't just have life after death, by the way. They will have life after life after death. <laughs> There's a word for that in the New Testament. It's called resurrection. In other words, they'll one day receive a perfect, glorified human body that is infinitely superior to the one they possessed in this life. The idea is, I believe today our loved ones aren't disembodied spirits. They're in some form of temporary body. I think Revelation kind of indicates that. But one day, they're going to get a brand new glorified body that will never get sick, that will never die, that will never age. It is powerful. It is unending. And by the way, don't make it some alien thing. There is going to be a tremendous amount of continuity between these bodies and those bodies. That's just the perfect version. 
What about our loved ones on the other side? They are still very much alive. I love this, man. They are still themselves. They're still themselves. In heaven, nothing, and, and some of you have heard this a lot in my message on family matters recently, a lot of this, but, but it's so good, we got to repeat it. In heaven, nothing about your present life is diminished. Can I say that again? Nothing about your present life is diminished. Well, I'm not that excited about heaven, pre, uh, Pastor, because I'm going to lose my kids, I'm going to lose my marriage, I'm going to lose my stuff. I'm, everything I care about here, gone, and apparently I'm going to be so alien up there that I just love a whole new set of things. Wait a minute. Nothing about your present life will be diminished. It will only be enhanced. Every relationship you have down here is a tiny sliver of the pie that God created you to have. All the best things you've experienced, the most beautiful things you've ever seen, the most gorgeous music you've ever heard, the most pleasurable things you've experienced. Listen, that's a slice of the pie. When we get to heaven, we're going to get the whole pie. In heaven, your mind is the same mind, only sharper. Your soul is the same soul, only completely pure now. Your skills are the same skills, but unhindered in their expression. God is going to change you in heaven. Yes, he is, but he's not going to obliterate or replace you. You will be you, but a better you than you can possibly imagine. I said before, there will be a lot of continuity between our present body and that future heavenly body. Remember the transfiguration when Jesus goes up on a mountain, he takes a couple of his closest followers, and in a single moment of time, it is not the carpenter from Nazareth in, in his body that had been affected for 33 years with scars and dirt on his feet and all those things that human beings have. He is transfigured, metamorpho, a metamorphosis. He puts on his glorified form for them to see. And he's talking with Moses and Elijah, and they're in their glorified forms. Guess what? They knew it was Moses. They knew it was Elijah. They knew it was still Jesus. But they were in those glorified, shining, eternal forms. In heaven, our bodies will be like Christ's. Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like his glorious body. It means no sickness, no disease, no arthritis, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer. No injury, no Alzheimer's, no aging, no pain. I've read this about 50 times, and I'm just going to read it again. In our resurrected state, Randy Alcorn, we'll have real spiritual bodies with physical substance. We'll be capable of talking, walking, touching, being touched. Christ's resurrection body could appear suddenly, apparently coming through a locked door, and disappear just as quickly. Christ ascended into heaven in his new body. This suggests we may be able to transcend the present law of physics. We may be able to fly. Christ ate food in his resurrection body. Both he and we will eat and drink in heaven. Every reference to sitting at a table and having a banquet in heaven should forever free us from the myth of floating around like ghosts. Though we'll eat and drink, there will be no hunger and thirst in heaven, at least none that remains unsatisfied. Our heavenly bodies apparently won't need what is now essential, food, drink, oxygen covering, but we will be fully capable of enjoying them. Heaven, man. Eternity. We talked about the ultimate place. We're not just going to live up there. Up there's coming down here. There's going to be a renovated planet Earth with a new Jerusalem that hangs above it, this massive city. I believe we're going to travel the universe. Why else did God create the cosmos if it's not for us to see and enjoy forever? One last thing, we're going to be done. By the way, don't get used to getting out this early. Some of you are like, I think he's making a turn. <laughs> eh, maybe. They're very much alive. They're still themselves. And finally, they are truly home. They're truly home. Be absent from the body is present with the Lord. That, that word present is a strong one. 
It means to be among one's own people and in one's own land. A lot of translations just say to be absent from the bodies, to be home with the Lord. What does home mean to you? Well, if you've ever traveled abroad, I've been to Nigeria, I've been to Uganda, been, been out of the country a few times, and I'm telling you, when you go there and you see how most the rest of the world has to live, and you like come back on that airplane and you walk through customs and you, and you see you see your country again, and you see, man, I'm a, I'm a Texas guy through and through, and I'm back in my place and back to, and, and listen, you know what I'm talking about. It's not, home is more than your house. Home's like your people, right? And, and your comfort and your place that when you're there, it's just right. May I suggest to you every taste of home you've ever experienced was but a foretaste of glory divine. There is something in our heart that longs for something more. We get little tastes of it, but we never get to stay there long, do we? God created you to go home. Your loved ones, your Jesus followers, they're home. As hard as it was to part from them, we wouldn't bring them back if we could. They're home. Hebrews 12, 22. I've come back to this verse with a fresh understanding over the last 10 years. 10 years November, that, 10 years December that my dad went home. You are come, Paul says, I believe Paul, unto Mount Zion. Let me set this up a little bit. He's drawn a distinction between Mount Sinai where God gave the Ten Commandments with Moses and fire and lightning and like the people are looking up at the mountain and Moses is up there and God's given him the Ten Commandments and it's like, it's terrifying. It's the glory of God just rumbling that mountain, shaking it with earthquakes, right? Lightning flashing, fire jumping. It is an impressive Whew, sight, right? So scary that Moses said, I, I, I'm trembling, I'm quaking. And the people were like, Moses, we don't want to go up there. We'll die. You go up there. Paul said, listen, you Christians, you Jesus followers, it, it's, you're not dealing with the impressiveness of Mount Sinai. Here's what you're dealing with. You are come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You're come to an innumerable company of angels. He said, I know you can't see it, but you Christians, it's all around you. You're come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. You are come to Jesus, the mediator of the New Testament. Hang on a minute. The spirits of just men made perfect. That's why this hour is so special, y'all, is when we come together as children of God and we're gathered here singing praises to Jesus, we are in that moment doing exactly what our loved ones are doing in heaven. In that moment, listen, the assembly around the Lamb, both here and there, are doing the exact same thing. And he says, your people on the other side... They are the souls of just men and women made perfect. In other words, when we knew them down here, we loved them and they were dear to us. But they were struggling like we're struggling. They had sins. They had problems with their attitudes. They had problems with addictions. They had brokenness. They had all the stuff we're dealing with. But he says, listen, your people on the other side, down here they were amazing. Up there they've been perfected. No struggle with sin, no struggle with addiction, no struggle with brokenness, no struggle with your past, no struggle. Listen, all that is gone. They've arrived. They're home. But then he says this. You're come before the spirits of just men, saved men, justified men, that are now made perfect, and you're come before Jesus, the mediator of the New Testament. You know what's going to make heaven heaven? Jesus. 
our faith will become sight. We're going to see his face. We're going to see the print of those nails in his hands and his feet. And the one who for, for all his ministry, little children, ran to him. None of that natural hesitation that kids sometimes have because they knew there's something about him I got to get close to. You know who else loved to be around Jesus? The most banged up people on earth. The prostitutes and the tax collectors and the drug addicts and the, they couldn't wait to be near him. By the way, if, if back then hurting broken people loved to get near him and we're the body of Christ and they don't want to be near us, something's off. People that don't, don't know Jesus shouldn't be comfortable around the church. Really? They were comfortable around him. So maybe we're a little unlike him if they don't want to get close to us. If there's not something so winsome and attractive that they're dying to get into our presence and into the presence of our churches. I'm just saying. Jesus. The one who knows you perfectly and still wanted you. Didn't want the new improved Facebook you. The one that's like got all the filters on it and airbrushed perfection and all the attainments you hope people think you have. And right, the carefully crafted you. He didn't care so much about that one. He loves the real banged up insecure you so much that he died for you. That's the one when we get to heaven, we're going to stand in his presence and fall at his feet. And forever, we're going to be with him. I want to ask you the question I ask in Judgment House and, and Brandon asks in Judgment House and James asks in Judgment House every night. Austin went home early. Not early on God's side of heaven, right on time. But for us, early. She was 21. It was totally unexpected. She had no time to prep, no time to make decisions. She didn't have an hour. She didn't have 10 seconds. She was home. If you were to die before the sun goes down, he says, it's not going to happen. It could happen. Would you be going home? Are you prepared for eternity? If you were to die before the sun went down and God were to ask you, why should I allow you into heaven, what would you say? Would you try to convince them you've been good? It won't work. But you don't have to. Because one already died to bring you back.